Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing, where our goal is to educate and debate specific stock investment ideas. Today we are going to talk about Lululemon. Famous for yoga pants, Lulu has been a great Canadian fashion success story. On the back of really strong growth in financial results, the stock price is up over 150% in the last two years. I wanted to take a look and see if this is still an attractive growth story or if the current valuation, which is about 40 times this year's earnings, is too stretchy. I had to do it one time. That's the pun. That's the last one. I promise. This video will review the business, the financials, and conclude with key considerations for investors, including bull, base, and bear case scenarios for the stock. Let's jump into it. Oh, and hey, if you like the video, please leave a comment with your thoughts down below and subscribe to our channel. Okay, now let's jump into it. The business. So Lulu, uh, as you probably know, is a designer and retailer of healthy, lifestyle-inspired athletic apparel and accessories. Uh, and it's famous and got its start with its uh, yoga pants. The uh, company has had incredible growth over the past few years, uh, both in North America, which you can see here. Um, you can see some of their stores and internationally, uh, as well as they've been growing into Asia. E-commerce, e I would note, is 26% of sales. So 26% of the $3.3 billion in revenue that they did in 2018 came from e-commerce or direct digitally. They've also got 440 stores, so you could, most of which are in the U.S. 349 of the stores are in North America. If we look at the stock price here, um, you can see what we were saying early, earlier. The stocks had a great run, uh, particularly since the beginning of 2018 here. You could see for a few years it was sort of just muddling along. Um, and then since the beginning of 2018 has, has started to run and the financial results is, as you're going to see in a second, have been really strong. Um, new CEO, uh, or what was the new CEO, Laurent Potdevin, um, he came in after, uh, the founder, um, left Chip Wilson. He had to resign over a workplace relationship. If you remember that news from back in early 2018, uh, after about half a year, Calvin McDonald uh, was appointed the new CEO in July of 2018. Uh, you, and then uh, at the end of 2018, heading into uh, 2019, as we all recall, the, the stock market more broadly had a sell-off. And so I thought one thing I'd just point out for investors is Lulu was down 30% over that period, sort of peak to trough, and while the S&P 500 uh, was down 18% over the same period. So you get a high multiple stock like Lululemon uh, potentially uh, or likely to have a little bit more downside and a pullback or a correction. And that's exactly what happened at the end of, of, uh, of 2018. Also want to note from our, the, the really strong technical analysis that Ostrich is becoming hopefully famous for is uh, we note the downward dog uh, pattern that emerged in late 2018 um, that was clearly a sign a springboard for the stock heading into into 2019. So again, lastly here, 2018 price to earnings of 51 times, uh, that's high, and then 42 times 2019 EPS guidance, and the stock does not pay a dividend, so something else to keep in mind. And here we go on the financial overview. Now this is gonna be pretty small, but I've, I've highlighted on the right-hand side um, some of the key takeaways. You can um, jump into page 18 of Lululemon's 2018 10K if you want to take a look. Um, you can see revenue's gone from 1.8 billion back in 2015 to 3.3, uh, so a four-year sales kegger of 16%. So that's really good growth, uh, particularly from a, a retailer. Gross margins 55% in the latest period. SG&A, so the expense side, has doubled. So Typical, particularly when you've got really strong growth, you've got to continue to invest in people, systems, infrastructure. Um, so note that SG&A has gone from 538 million up to 1.1 billion uh, over the over the four-year period. Also note share count has been down. So despite um, trading at 40 to 50 times earnings, Lulu's been using some of their excess free cash flow to buy back shares. So share count's gone from 144 million or 144, yeah, on a diluted basis, 
down to 134, so down about 10 million shares over the period. And the balance sheet's really strong. Really strong. So net cash position, um, here you can see cash at the end of 2018 of 881 million and about 400 million in inventory. So for retailers, that's something that we want to look at and just see how quickly they're turning through their inventory. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So we'll go into a couple of key points, three or four key points, and then we'll jump into key considerations for the stock. The first, and we talked about it at the outset, results have been really strong. So here's a, a quick snapshot of their Q2 uh, 2019 results. They look at some of their growth pillars, men's revenue, so the men's category up 35%, North America's up 21%, digital comp sales, so e-commerce sales are up 31% over the comparable period, international up 34 I mean, this is, this is growth that almost any company would, uh, would die for. Um, Earnings, I won't go through everything here. You can see earnings good, margins are expanding slightly 20 basis points. And then here's the guidance at the end uh, of the page here. So they're they're guiding towards 3.8 billion in revenue, so up from that 3.3 last year. And diluted earnings per share of I just say 465. So somewhere in that range there of 463 to 470. So really strong interim results. The next thing we're going to do is they hosted an analyst day earlier in 2019 um, and we're just going to give a couple of the quick takeaways but they, they put out some ambitious growth targets to the to the market um, over the next five years so through to 2023. So the first thing I want to highlight is is the total addressable market that they, they put out in this presentation and again um, this is available on their website if you want to go and download it and take a look. They talk about a a three trillion dollar global wellness market. So um, there's a huge market that they can go after. Uh, it's been on trend and definitely growing over the past few years. Uh, so they believe they've got lots of room to grow. They also, so here's sort of what they laid out as their targets over the next five years. The men's category, they want to double it. Digital sales, they want to double. International, they want to quadruple. Uh, so they see a ton of growth on the international side, um, getting the brand more established, new stores, etc. What does that all mean from a financial perspective? Revenue growth in the low teens, so I think 13% is really what they're saying. Um, and what does that compare to historically? Uh, 16%. So a little bit lower, um, but still very, very strong. Gross margin expansion, modest. So at 55% now, they're saying maybe we can continue to inch this up. Maybe it's 56, 57, 57%. SG&A leverage, um, so modest leverage, meaning I believe what they mean by this is that it SG&A won't rise quite as quickly as revenue. EPS growth greater than revenue growth. And so we'll, we'll have some math at the end that looks at what your EPS growth might be over the period. So that's what they put out as ambitious targets over the next five years. The other thing they talked about, it, it was really international. So they want to have a, a 4x increase in their international revenue, which was $360 million in 2018. Uh, so that's, that's one thing to say. The second thing is, how are you going to do it? And, and what's the split going to look like? So it's over a 30% compound annual growth rate. They see a lot of it coming from China. Uh, you can see the pie chart here historically and future state um, and they also see Asia more broadly playing a large a large role in the international growth. That's it for the analyst day. Again, there's lots of good stuff in there if you want to, if you want to take a look, uh, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of, of key things. Store count is is one other thing I wanted to talk about. As it's a big part of their strategy is continue to grow and, and add new stores. Just wanted to look at the current uh, lay of the land. So 440 stores uh, globally, 285 of those in the U.S., 65 in Canada. Really what this tells you is that, I mean, if they can get the brand right, um, they've got room to grow both in the U.S. Uh, as well as internationally. So there's, there is, in theory, lots of room to run in terms of growing the store count. And the last um, point that I want to highlight is the e-commerce uh, margins. And so 
They highlight in 2018, e-commerce was 26% of total sales, uh, 858 million up from 577. So it's been a great source of growth on the, on the top line. Uh, but what's really interesting here is that on the margin side, uh, it's an even bigger contributor. So it was 26% of total revenues in 2018, but it was 41% of operating income. Um, so that, that gets the fire emoji. Um, and I think this could be a huge driver of growth for the stock going forward. I think if, if, if this ends up being, if we look back at this three, four years out from now and the stock prices continue to appreciate uh, meaningfully, I think this will probably have been a key to the story makes total sense when you're you're selling digitally um, you don't have the overhead of the stores so it makes a ton of sense uh, that the operating margins are going to be stronger um, but you're going to see really nice flow through to the bottom line and to earnings if they're able to continue to grow on the digital side oh i lied there's one more point i wanted to make i wanted to talk a little bit about valuation and, and i get a little bit nervous uh, when i'm trying to explore stocks that trade at really high valuations because it's it's outside of my comfort zone but i thought let's i wanted to start by just looking at where this stock has traded historically so we know that right now based on the current share price of close to two hundred dollars a share it trades at 43 times earnings and that's the uh four dollars and 65 cent uh sort of that midpoint of the company guidance for fiscal 2019, which should end in January uh, of 2020. So it's a few months away. And what I've done is I've compared it to the, it's not, it's not perfect. There's lots of ways you could look at this, but I thought, let's just look at a few points in time. Let's look at the share price at the end of each fiscal year and compare it with the earnings per share that they reported in that year. So if you look back at the uh, beginning of, at the end of last fiscal year, they're we're trading at 38 times earnings. Previous year, 30 times earnings. The one before that, 30 times earnings. The one before that, 32. And then the one before that, 39. Um, so you do see a trend. I think the one the one clear thing is this is not a cheap stock. And it, and it has not been a cheap stock. Um, that being said, it has definitely traded cheaper than 43 times earnings. So it's, it's definitely trading at the highest level on a pure, you know, my rudimentary crude uh, PE multiple here that I've just pulled uh, uh, over the last five years. It's trading at a rich valuation, but it's always traded at, a, at an attractive or a rich multiple. So just something to, to consider, and we'll come back to that. All right, so let's move into key considerations for the stock, and then we'll go through our bull, base, and bear case scenario. So what are the strengths for Lulu? Uh, super strong brand positioning. It's aligned with growing health and wellness trends. We'll put yoga in brackets, but this is an area where I think more people are spending more dollars and uh, they've just got, they've got the positioning right. I mean, this is what they do. Uh, and when you think of Lululemon, you think of that sort of, a, they talk about hashtag sweat life and their, their positioning near as I can tell, is spot on. They've, they've kind of nailed it. Second strength uh, is kind of builds on it is they've got first mover advantage, right? They, they sort of, people talk about them having created the category and um, they've been doing this since basically the inception. They've been doing this for longer than their competitors. So think about Nike, Adidas, Under Armour. Uh, there's other more traditional retailers trying to get into the segment because it's such an attractive and growing segment, but they've got the first mover advantage. Other strengths are more obvious just on the financial results and the balance sheet. Really strong um, revenue growth, so it's not quite uh, 20%. I'm exaggerating a little bit there. Um, the margin's 55%, so you've got really strong 20%, uh, really strong revenue growth, sorry, and you've got attractive margins and you've got a strong balance sheet, uh, no debt. And then uh, as of the interim balance sheet adjusted net cash of about 500 million or a little bit more than that, I adjusted it for their gift cards. Uh, they've got a liability every time they sell gift cards, they get the cash, um, but theoretically those 
gift cards people are going to walk into the store and buy stuff with. So I just made a, a, a quick adjustment to the cash. Let's talk about risks. Okay, uh, we won't spend much time on the first one, but recession, time you're talking about a consumer, uh, consumer spending, uh, retail business, uh, particularly, you know, Lulu plays in the kind of the high price point range. Um, so the risk could be uh, of a recession. Number two, it's retail. Uh, and despite Lulu's success, they, they are clearly the ones bucking the trend here. Um, most of their peers in other segments and markets are really struggling. And they do have close to 500 stores across the world. They have leases. Uh, so they have, you know, uh, they've got a great brand and they've got a lot of momentum, but they're still operating in, in retail, which is a tough environment, tough industry. Third, growing competition. Again, because the segment's so attractive, um, other players are really trying to, to get into it. Um, and the fabrics, and this is noted in their in their risk factors in the 10K, and it's one of the ones that jumped out at me. Fabrics and the manufacturing technologies not patented, so any of the fabrics or materials can be can be imitated. Um, and so they've got their brand, but it's not like someone couldn't come out and design a pair of pants that has the exact same material and feel as Lulu's. Another risk is execution. Um, so we've got huge growth plans in front of them. Can they successfully grow the men's segment? That's a relatively small and growing part of the business. New stores, can they grow the brand internationally? And then digital, are they going to be able to continue to grow on the digital side, which we talked about, brings a ton of additional margin that will drop down to earnings and cash flow. Another one, ability to innovate and stay on trend. Um, anytime you're in fashion, uh, you've got to, uh, you've got to continue to stay out in front of that. Inventory management, we've got about 400 million of inventory. It turns about 3.6 times a year. Uh, I don't really know how to bench, I mean, I know how to, but I did not. I did not benchmark it against other retailers. Um, but it, it's a risk in, in terms of the inventory that they carry. Historically, they've had about $20 million a year of, of write-offs of inventory. They've either gone obsolete or, or gone missing. Um, so just keep Keep that in mind. I don't think that $20 million is anything to be super concerned about, but just a, a risk of the business if they had inventory and, a, and significant inventory that they couldn't sell. And then the last one is the stretched, the stretched valuation. Key drivers for the stock, um, more broadly, health and wellness spending. Makes sense. Uh, and then specifically to Lulu, we've got the same store sales growth or the, the comparable store growth. Um, and I think a big driver of, of that is going to be new products and the men's line. So within existing stores, adding new products, uh, upping the check size, introducing men's line, increased traffic. Uh, those are the elements that could drive that same store sales growth. And then they've got their new stores and, and international growth that they talked about. So a lot of room to increase their footprint internationally. Um, and, and then lastly, the digital penetration. So all three of those items are going to contribute to the overall revenue growth, um, but being able to nail each one, um, given sort of the lofty expectations for the stock, those are going to be the key drivers. All right. Uh, so without further ado, here is the illustrative uh, bull, base, and bear case scenario. And again, uh, it's just illustrative. There's lots of ways to look at this, but just to give you a sense of how the numbers could potentially shake out. So on the bull side, let's just assume that they achieve their five-year plan. Their five-year plan is ambitious. You, you could say your bull case should be even, even more or better than that, and, and that could be the case. But I've, I've started with, let's assume they achieve their five-year plan. Revenue is going to grow at about 13% a year. That's what they've said. That'll get you to $6 billion in revenue in 2023, uh, up from the, the about 3.8 that they're going to do this year. Gross margins, I've taken them up from 55 to 57. And I've assumed a little bit of in the way of share buybacks. I won't share every single assumption with you, but, but roughly you're going to get to about 1075 of earnings per share in 2023. And consistent with historical valuations and historical multiples, if, if they pull off their, their five-year plan, uh, grow, you know, top line growth of 13% is a little bit lower, but I think everything would suggest that probably continue uh, to trade at a really rich multiple 
uh, assuming, of course, that the future continues to look bright. So consistent valuation to historical levels, 35 times earnings, and that implies a future share price of $376.25. And rather than discount it back, uh, what I thought I'd do is just talk about what does that mean yeah, based on the current share price. And that would result uh, over the five years of about a 17% annual share price appreciation for investors. So really nice, really nice return, no dividend here. Uh, but this, you know, if the company hits their five-year plan um, and the valuation of 35 times earnings kind of maintains at that level, should be a nice return for investors here. What about the base case? Um, the base case, I just wanted to tweak down so they sort of almost achieve their, um, their five-year plan. So revenue growth of 10% a year instead of 13. That's $5.3 billion in 2023. Gross margins are flat at 55%. And based on that, you get $7.50 of earnings. And based on the growth rate, I've scaled back the multiple. So if they don't get to 1075 in, in earnings, just trying to think I calculated what that, yeah. Sorry, just to jump back on the bull side. 1075 in EPS would be 23% earnings per share growth over the period. And so 750 would be meaningfully lower than that. And so I've cut back the multiple again, you can play around with it. But 25 times that number, that implies a future share price of $187.50. And I think here's one of the issues, and we talked about it at the top, but here's one of the issues with Lululemon stock. It's sort of priced to perfection. Um, now, we could be being way too conservative with these numbers, and that's with, with, growth, drop, with growth stocks, sorry, that is really the trick. Um, you know, if, if you put 10% growth in and margins flat, you're, you're likely going to end up with a share price that's not going to be interesting. So you've really got to believe in the growth story. Anyway, the, the $187 is a negative 1% kegger. Again, no dividends. So uh, if you believe in the base case, it's not really a story for you at these share prices. Uh, and lastly, the bear case. Um, revenue growth of 5%. And so just like we might have been able to be a little bit more bullish in, uh, in uh, uh, on our bull case on the bear side, and I'm just noting a, a typo here, and I'm fixing it. Uh, I don't know what the actual revenue would be, uh, but revenue kegger of 5%, it definitely wouldn't hit the $6 billion mark. Um, and sorry, just to finish my thought there. The bear case could also be uh, more to the downside. So I don't think we've taken the bear case down to extreme levels either. Uh, revenue is still growing positively. Uh, what I have done here is taken margins down. So whether it's the cost of manufacturing going up or probably more likely in my mind is more competition coming into the space. Um, margins of 50% and, and only a few years ago that's where they were at they were at 50% so in a scenario where revenue is still growing at mid single digits but margins come back down to 50% uh, I did cut back SG&A expenses because if they're not growing at double digit rates uh, they're not going to be investing um, in, on the cor corporate side and head office and headcount in the same way but that gets you to EPS of $4.50 so essentially um, uh, flat to where we are today. So that, that would not be a great outcome. Uh, put a 20 times multiple, give, you know, given the brand, I don't think this is ever really going to be a low, a low multiple stock. And that of course would not be a great outcome for investors and implied future share price of $90 or negative 18% kegger from current share price. So, um, again, really illustrative. We're going out five years here. So any little tweaks in our assumptions are going to have massive implications out five years, so they can really get magnified. So just take that into, into consideration, play around with it a little bit, but just to give you an idea. Um, so that's it. L let me know what you think. I mean, um, it, am I being too conservative on the growth side, or is this truly a stock that's, that's priced for perfection? We'll be back soon with more content, but until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand.